This program is brought to you by Grand Valley State University. All right. Well, you heard the young man from uh, Grand Valley State University say the thing to do is to don't be apathetic. Get out there, make some noise, and see if we can make something happen. So we appreciate the fact that you've gotten out there this evening to make some noise, see if you can make something happen. Because, as you heard Bill Rustin suggest there, uh, the year 2010 is a watershed year in our uh, in Michigan's history. It's because of those two words, term limits. We're going to have a new governor in 2010, new secretary of state in 2010, new attorney general in 2010. 31 of 38 state senators will be new, term limited out, and 45 of 110 state representatives will be new because their former occupants of those seats are term limited out. So. We have a watershed election coming up in the year 2010. We have the conviction at the Center for Michigan that we own the state's future anyway, not the politicians in Lansing, or not, certainly not the politicians in Washington. So it's up to us to direct those folks who uh, aspire to be our elected representatives next year in the proper path, as it were. And that is the whole idea behind the uh, Michigan's Defining Moment campaign. It's not a partisan effort. It's not a Democratic effort or a Republican effort or an independent effort or a conservative or a liberal effort. It is a completely nonpartisan effort designed to gather the voices of at least 10,000 Michigan residents, and we're coming very close to that number. You folks will help us considerably to reach it. Uh, and boil down, distill what folks have to say, and present that information to those who aspire to be our elected leaders in the year, uh, in the election of 2010. So that's the thrust behind uh, the Michigan's Defining Moment campaign. Before we get into the specifics of what we're going to ask you to do to help us set that common ground agenda this evening, let's go around the room and have you introduce yourselves. We have a good sized group this evening, so uh, if we could just, we, we'd love to hear from everybody about uh, what you would like to see happen in Michigan's future, the one thing that you think is most important. But I think in, in uh, light of the fact that we have such a, a large group this evening, uh, if we could just go around the room and get some quick introductions, then we'll have more time for the meat of the discussion a little bit later on. So could we begin, oh, I don't know, can we begin in the back and kind of work our way forward? How about someone in the back row? Or are you folks all? My name is Kim Kim Hill. I'm Mike Sophie Hill. I'm Thank you. 
Good. Thank you. You're on them too. All right. How about you, Jim? And then we'll back. Bill Keller. All right. Fred Perez of the community. Okay. Good. Thanks for coming. Yes, ma'am. Lynn Bell, Housing and Education, Interior of Minus College. All right. Uh, where are we? Over here? Hi, Anna Anderson. I'm a student. I'm a student here at Valley. All right, good. Thanks for coming. Uh, Sarah Charles, I'm a student at Okay, good. Olivia Darnley, I'm All right, we've got some fine schools here tonight. Good, yeah. Andrew Stevens, student here at Grand All right, good. Sir? John Wardrop, a former teacher, former business person associated with the Hollis Fine Center. I would love to see a plan for our future devoid of special interest. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm Hillary Snell. I'm a lawyer in Grand Rapids. All right. Yes. Yeah. I'm Lewis Jander Noah. I'm a trying to retire. I'm 85 years of age, but I'm still interested in our economy. <laughs> I think I did a group or two with your son. It's it's on <coughs> a few months back. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Sir, ma'am. <laughs> Fred and Judy Anderson, uh, Granville, a uh, small former uh, retired business owner. Okay, good. Thanks for coming. Yes, sir. Uh, John Sampson, and I'm a volunteer at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential <coughs> Museum and Special Projects at East Campbell High School. Okay, good. Yeah. You folks? Uh, this is my wife, Linda, and my name is Dave Bolton. And uh, we're both retired. I'm retired from the financial arena. Okay, good. Thanks for coming. How about you, gentlemen? Uh, Jake Kemmerly, student here at Grand Valley. Good. Brian Flanagan, Allenstein Center. Brian, you know, yes. In Austin, up I'm also a staffer with the Allenstein Center. Okay, good. I think we got everybody, did we? Anyone come in? Oh, a couple of, yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Well, good. Thank you all for coming. Now we have a little bit of entertainment for you. We call this the Michigan Game. You know, the Center for Michigan is located in Ann Arbor, <laughs> and you can <coughs> sort of see the color scheme there. If the lights were down, you'd see that that was sort of a maze and blue color scheme. So some of the rest of us tried to say, you know, we should call it the Michigan State game and change that color scheme a little bit, but that didn't fly. So we're stuck with the Michigan game this evening. We hope you enjoy it. We've got a few questions for you. Looks like everything is working. Those of you who have clicker devices, and I know that we only have one for about every two people here this evening. Unfortunately, they only trust me with two dozen of these things. Those of you who have a clicker device get to vote. And you vote by uh, selecting the buttons one, two, or three, depending on which of, the, which of these you think is the correct answer to the question. Maybe what we can do is after you've voted for the first question, you can pass the device off to somebody sitting next to you who doesn't have it, and they can vote for the next one. Or you can do this on a consultative basis or something like that. But in any case, you know the bad news, we lost three quarters of a billion jobs in this past decade. Uh, but the good news is that not all the professions declined. We did pick up some high-tech new economy jobs between 2000 and 2008. And so the question is, how many of those do you think we picked up in the state of Michigan? And you can vote just by pressing one, two, or three. If you've done it correctly, the little LED will light up. There's a little green LED on your clicker device there. I tested them earlier. It catches them all the way from the back of the room, so it's pretty good technology. Some of them do have slightly sticky buttons, I've found. We've had a few of these in restaurants and so forth, and I think maybe some salsa got spilled on one or something. <laughs> I see that we've got 22 votes in. If your eyes are real good, you can follow the voting up there in the top. There's a little, uh, there's a box up there that says responses, and I see we've got 23 responses and one sticky button. Try your, try your device again. It won't register twice. If you've already voted, it'll only take it once. If it, if it didn't register for some reason, maybe we'll pick it up on the second round. I'm still seeing just 23. We should have 24. All the devices are functioning. Well, let's move along. We don't want to spend too much time here. I'll show you how you voted. Yeah, look at that, an exact split, almost exactly half of you said 15,000 and half of you said 57,000 with just a couple of you saying only 5,000. Well, the good news is we did actually pick up 57,000. So those of you who said 57,000, give yourselves a hand and pass your button off to your partner. Here's another question. How interested are Michigan residents in higher education and other forms of advanced training? Good question to ask on a campus like this, I would, I would say. 
Are we seeing our folks flocking to the campuses? Are we seeing basically flat enrollment? Or are we seeing people saying, no thanks, high school is good enough? What do you think? One, two, or three. Twenty-two votes are in. Whoops. Twenty-three. Hope we can get that one device squared away. Or maybe it's just a very thoughtful person. Well, let's see. Let's go ahead. Oh, okay. 83% of you uh, said that we're very interested in flocking to the campuses, and you're absolutely right. We are seeing lots and lots of folks interested in higher education. It does not come without a cost, however. How much in student loans do Michigan public university students take out in a year? Now, I'll call your attention to the fact that we're saying just the public universities. We're not talking about Calvin or Aquinas or Hope or any of those really expensive ones. We're just talking about the real bargains like Grand Valley State University. Some of you are thinking, my kids got about <coughs> half a million themselves. 50 million, 100 million, or 1.2 really big ones are your choices. 23, we still got that. There we go, we've got 24 this time. Let's see how you voted. All right, again, interesting. We've got an exact split between the upper two choices with a few folks taking the lower choice. Well, again, it is the big choice. The big number, 1.2 million, isn't that amazing? In one year, in just the public universities, which are less expensive on the whole than the private ones. We know we've taken some hits in this state. How would you say we rank on quality of life measures, though? There are folks who actually measure these things on scales and compare states against each other. So comparing home ownership, recreational opportunity, and philanthropy, which are sort of basic definitions of quality of life, do we rank near the top nationally among the states, somewhere in the middle of the pack, or towards the bottom? Can we get that one last one in? Try your button again just to be sure. Give it a good firm press. Watch for the LED. There we go. All right. Well, most of you said near the top, and you're absolutely correct. We do rank near the top nationally. That surprises some people, but when you consider what we're talking about here, the fact is that we have always been strong in all those areas. Here's a crystal ball question for you. When we put this together, the year was 2007, when the campaign was just getting started. So we said, okay, 10 years out. What's going to be the projected budget deficit for the year 2017? Are we looking at 50 million, 500 million, or 10 billion? And of course, if you're a stickler for accuracy, you know that we cannot have any budget deficit by law, by constitution, in fact. Uh, so we're talking about the structural deficit, the gap between projected revenues and projected expenditures for the year 2017. We have 23. <laughs> this is becoming a trend. There we go, 24. Okay, we've got some pessimists in the room. More than half of you say it's 10 billion, and more than half of you are absolutely correct. It's projected to be 10 billion for the year 2017. Well, what can we take away from this? We, we still live in a state that has a truly distinctive quality of life, even though, of course, we have, we have taken some hits over the last decade or more. Uh, it means that transformation is upon us. We know that we are transitioning from an economy that drove our state during the 20th century to, well, we don't know where we're going. And, but we do know that the, that the fact that we need to get from point A to point B uh, argues that we need top flight leadership. It argues that we're going to need people in place who will be able to make the difficult trade-offs that that kind of transition implies. And that, of course, is the purpose behind holding these community conversations. Now, here's a little old news for you. Uh, again, we put this slide together some time ago, and it says that we've had 180 community conversations of 1,800 people. Well, we've had 400 and some, I think close to 500 by now, and well over 9,000 people have taken part in these community conversations to date. This campaign has been going on for almost two years. So let me bring you up to date real quickly on what those folks have said, because tonight's discussion builds on previous discussions. It builds on 
uh, concerns, issues, comments, and so forth that we've surfaced over the past two years. So we took those back to Ann Arbor and Lansing, boiled them down, and realized that essentially what people were telling us was they want to see three things happen in Michigan. Here's the first one up there at the top. They want to see us have a talented and globally competitive workforce in this state. How might we accomplish that? Two strategies have been proposed. This is fundamentally a problem of education. We can focus on traditional education, our pre-K through 16, in other words, pre-kindergarten through a, a baccalaureate, and do a better job of that. We know that we're not doing the best possible job we can with education at that level. So that's one way we can improve our uh, workforce for the state. The other way we can work on our workforce for going forward is to recognize that we have a number of people who have had their traditional education. They have, in some cases, many cases have graduated from college even, now find themselves in midlife, 30s, 40s, 50s, without a job because of the loss of the jobs that we've had in the state. They also lack the skills, many of these people, to compete in the current work, uh, workplace. So these folks need continuing education. These folks need the Grand Rapids Community Colleges and the Monroe Community Colleges and the Kalamazoo College Community Colleges and the Lansing Community Colleges and other sort of non-traditional opportunities for lifelong learning. The second thing that people have told us is vitally important is that we have a vibrant economy and great quality of life. Those two things, of course, go together. If we have a vibrant economy, we will have a great quality of life. How might we accomplish this, though? Well, four main strategies emerged from our previous discussions. The first one focuses on diversification. We know that we have had all of our economic eggs in one basket through the bulk of the 20th century. We have been a manufacturing state, and we have been even more specifically an automobile manufacturing state. If it weren't the big three themselves, it was all those tier two and tier three companies that we have that produce parts for the big three. So Michigan has been heavily devoted to manufacturing for a long time. That needs to change. We need to diversify. A second strategy that's been proposed, we're calling entrepreneurialism. Uh, the folks with the big ideas, the folks with the creativity, the folks with, uh, you know, with, with something that they're producing on their kitchen table or in their garage that's going to change the world. Those are the folks we need to encourage to come to Michigan if they're not here already or stay in Michigan if they are here already. So what that amounts to is we need an entrepreneur-friendly climate according to this strategy in the state of Michigan. If we can create that, we have an opportunity to hitch our way into the next big thing. A third strategy that's been proposed under this heading we're calling quality of place. It simply means let's focus on and capitalize on the strengths that we know we have. We have something like one-sixth of the world's fresh water, either within the state's boundaries or touching the world's boundaries, or up to the state's boundaries. That's an important thing. We have tremendous recreational opportunities. We have this wonderful manufacturing base as far as that's concerned. We do have fine cities. They need some fixing up a bit and so forth. So by emphasizing the positive things about the state, perhaps we can make it more attractive and, again, begin to attract new businesses and thrive and flourish that way. And finally, one strategy that's been proposed is a sort of a marketing approach or, or advertising approach. Uh, we know that when we talk to people outside the state of Michigan, they think of Michigan as one of two things. Well, they, one of two things comes to mind. Either they think of the automobile industry or they think of the city of Detroit. Now, those of us who are not involved in the automobile industry and don't live in the city of Detroit know that the state doesn't really boil down to those two simple elements. It's something else altogether once you get outside of that area. So perhaps we need to give the state a new identity, a fresh kind of identity, an image that makes it different than what's in people's minds. And the idea that Phil Power, the president of uh, uh, the Center for Michigan likes particularly, is to call it the North Coast. That sort of plays off the idea of the East Coast and the West Coast both of which have a certain amount of uh, attractiveness, a certain panache, as it were. So perhaps the North Coast is a way we can rebrand the state and attract people that way. All right, the third thing that people have told us they want to see going forward is an effective, efficient, and accountable government in this state. We've had precious little of that to see for the last how many years. How do we accomplish this? Well, three main strategies have been proposed. One is to focus on accountability and bipartisanship. 
This is a sort of council of perfection. We want people who are not particularly accountable and not at all bipartisan to become accountable and be bipartisan. <laughs> How do we get them to do that? The floor is open for suggestions. <laughs> But in any case, this is a strategy that perhaps can be pursued. And, and, and I say that somewhat facetiously because uh, actually we are seeing some very subtle signs that perhaps some elements of bipartisanship are beginning to make their way in, into the precincts of Lansing. And the Center for Michigan can claim some credit for that. It's begun to, be, to, to pull folks together from the different parties from the opposite sides of the aisle almost clandestinely, I would say, because the party, the folks who run the parties are not pleased about that at all. So they are actually sort of meeting on the QT. They're having dinner together with folks from the Center for Michigan, for example, and talking about things uh, and, and not letting their party bosses know that that's going on. So we're seeing some signs of some thought. It may be possible. A second strategy that's uh, been proposed is to create clear taxing and spending of, uh, priorities. Uh, the fact is that Michigan is not a particularly high tax state, but it is a very confusing tax state, particularly when we're talking about the business tax. Uh, we thought we fixed that a couple of years ago. We found out different. Our business community is not at all happy with the new uh, Michigan business tax that replaces the single business tax. Uh, and, and it's because it's not predictable. They don't know what their tax liability, bis individual business owners do not know what their tax liability is going to be based on their economic activities, and that's not a good thing. So that's, that's something we need to perhaps revisit. Uh, that's, a, that's a clear taxing issue. And then there's the, the other side of taxing, of course, is the spending. Many people have called attention to uh, the fact that the largest single expenditure in our budget, the, largest, uh, the department that gets the largest single share of uh, revenue in our budget is, anyone? It's prisons, it's corrections. We, we, we are a state that incarcerates a higher percentage of our adult population, I think, than any other. You've got facts on that in your, uh, in your blue lighthouse book there. If we're not the highest, we're one of the top. We spend a, a very large amount of money on incarceration. I just read the other day that the, that the net present value of incarcerating an 18-year-old for life, in other words, when we lock them up and throw away the key and they're 18 years old, that costs you and me $1 million. That's how much we pay to incarcerate someone for life. And that's not counting, the, that's just, that's just uh, housing them. That's not counting the, uh, the, the legal costs that we will incur uh, because of all their appeals and so forth. All right, so, that, so some people have, called, have noticed that kind of thing and said, hmm, maybe our spending priorities are not particularly uh, correctly lined up. Not trying to put ideas in your mind, just sort of summarizing here. Finally, government collaboration and service sharing is the third uh, strategy that's been proposed under this heading. Uh, the two words to, to, to keep in mind here are home rule. Michigan is a home rule state in spades. We have uh, just under 2,000 local units of government in this state, counting our 83 counties. Uh, I forgot how many townships it is and how many cities and villages. I think it's about five, between five and 600 cities and villages and the rest are townships. Uh, you can add to that several thousand, a couple thousand school districts, which behave in many ways like uh, cities and villages because they have taxing authority. So we have an awful lot of small local units of government. That fragmentation creates inefficiency. Many people have pointed to that and said, perhaps we don't need a system that was created in the Northwest Ordinance in 1787 that allows everybody to be within uh, horseback ride of their, of their local unit of government in half a day anymore, you know, in the year 2009. Perhaps we could revisit that. My daughter lives in Arizona. I happen to know that they get along fine with 15 counties. We have 83, zero townships, and a couple of hundred cities and villages. So it can be done with far fewer local units of government, and that implies efficiencies that can be gained by doing that. All right, and of course the other possibility is simply service sharing. They don't have to combine, they can share services across these lines. That's once through very quickly of what's been talked about over the last couple of years just by way of a summary for you. Now what we want you to do, if you would please, is to give us some direction. We would love to be able to go to these candidates for office next year and say, here's the list. Start at the top, work your way down. You know? Do everything on this list, please. These are all important. We, we know they're all important. But that doesn't seem to be realistic. What we really need to do is go to them with one strong, leading priority and say, this is the first thing to fix. 
This is the first thing to do. This is the most important thing for driving Michigan forward in the future. So we were asking you to tell us what's the most important thing on that list. These are the nine strategies we just talked about. They're in the order that we talked about them in. The two at the top there are the ones that have to do with education and the workforce. The next four are the ones that have to do with economic development. And the last three are the ones that have to do with government efficiency and accountability. From your own point of view, which one of these is the most urgent strategy that we per should pursue? Recognizing fully that it's very difficult to separate these. <coughs> well, you have your clicker device. Do we only vote once? We'll, we'll, we'll vote once. There are two of us, we have to fight about which one. <laughs> well, here's, no, we'll, we'll take a show of hands for those of you who don't have clickers. But, but what we're going to do is we're going to vote once to select the first topic of conversation. Then we'll come back to the list, we'll revisit the list, and uh, you'll get a second chance to, to nominate a second alternative. And, I, and I'm not going to disenfranchise anybody. If you have a clicker, fine. If you don't, we'll add your votes to those of the other. As a matter of fact, that won't work because I don't have the counts from the clickers, and I don't want to calculate the percentages just standing up here. Uh, so we'll, we'll do it by a show of hands. I think that's probably the best way. We'll leave the clickers out of it. I'll give you a second to think about this. You've got, you've got information there in, your, uh, in the blue books. If you've got a copy of that handy. Or, or just go from the gut. Whatever strikes you as the most. I missed it. Is this a show of hands for the second priority? No, or your first priority. Then we'll do it again for your second one okay. later on. Everybody ready to vote? Can you guys help me count here? Mandy, are you there? Can you help me count? <laughs> All right, how many would say number one? Pre-K through 16 education. Okay, that's a pretty strong group. I, Thirteen. How many would say number two? None. Three. Okay. I can't see too well in the back there because of the glare on my glasses. How about number four? I see two in the back. Five? Yeah, okay, number five. We have one up here. Six? Number six, number seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many, Mandy? Six. Six. Number eight. Ah, one, two, three, four, five. Twelve. Twelve, okay, yeah, there's one in the back that I can't see. How about number nine? Last one. One. Well, we have 13 for number one and 12 for number eight. So we will discuss number one for the next, <coughs> mm, we have until nine o'clock, don't we? Let's give ourselves 20 minutes. Here's our question for you. Oh, that's old news. What action steps should Michigan take to implement that urgent strategy, which was pre-K through 16 education?
want to give back their 6% raise, they're going to lose 32 teachers, and his program might not even be around next year. So if the school system can look at sustainable, regular funding on, on a planned basis, you can make all the plans you want about education, but it's not going to come to fruition unless you have state. Yeah, okay, good. Other comments? Floor is open. We're looking for your action steps. What would you suggest we do? I'm having trouble seeing that pop. Yes, ma'am. I would say that it's really critical that the preschool programs were reinstated. Reinstate the preschool programs. Yes. Lots of research shows that uh, the human development that takes place from birth to about, what, age five, something like that, is critically important to everything that follows. Right. In fact, it, so there, there are studies that show that it is more cost effective to put dollars into that training than almost anything else. Yes, sir. Um, my uninformed perception is that there's been education well, etc. With the new schools of choice and so on, and uh, charter schools and so on, we seem to be, it's my perception, we seem to be at risk of entering an era where um, we have many different constituencies and many different units of education. And I, for one, am confused about how funding is even administered now in this state. Uh -huh. So what, what is your action step? What are you proposing that we do? Uh, I would certainly appreciate identifying what the current costs of education are for K through 12 and how they're handled by the school, by the taxing authorities, which are tied into this thousands of cities and towns, hundreds of school districts or whatever it is. Where does the money go? Like a, how does the money trickle down today? Okay. How does it behave as it trickles? Okay. Good. Thank you. Oh, you're going to pass those around? Yes, sir. Have to be looked at. Programs tend to take on a life of their own. 
Other comments? Yes, sir. Quick pen. I was talking about the trickle down for current financing. Make it, make it understandable by the taxpayers. But uh, let's expand it beyond just public education. I'd like to know in relative terms well, how is public funding uh, currently dispersed and deployed? And let's compare it with what we can understand of private funding of pre K through 12th grade as a standard or a watermark or a comparison, at the very least, if they're doing it more efficiently and effectively, or if they're not. And I'd like to know if we're that intermediate funding stream that goes either way, to public or private schools today, if it happens. Financing, joint financing of school buses, whatever. Okay, good, thank you. Other comments? Back here, yeah. As a college student, um, our Michigan premise has just been a premise, and I understand we don't have the funds for it, but there should be some incentive for kids to do well in the meet because not only our incentive was to get the scholarship money, but it was a way to judge schools and how well they were doing. So now if kids don't have that incentive for the scholarship to go to college, there's no reason to bother with the test and study for it and angst over it like everyone does. So now they can just make pretty patterns on it. <laughs> so there should be some kind of incentive, okay. whether monetary or something. Are you advocating refunding Michigan Promise specifically? Well, of course I am. I'm a student. Sure. But That's if okay. we don't have that, that. <laughs> even just some kind of recognition for it, Okay, gotcha. It, it's okay to advocate in your self-interest here tonight. <laughs> yes, sir. And then we'll catch you some. And if I can add on problems with, we got three three kids in college right now. Yeah. Uh, the funding side is important. I also bring up the cost side. Um, I don't have an action step in terms of cost, but it has to be looked at because it, it, for, for all of us who do pay for college, either directly or indirectly, it, it is. It is something that's hard to fathom in, in regards to where the burden comes. It comes later as students get out and have to pay the student loans back for, for a long period of time. So cost is important. So, so trying to make and trying to control it, I guess, would be the action. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, coming from someone who's just paying back those costs, I think I did my first uh, student loan payment last week. Um, I, I guess I'm in the I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the hole up to of around fifty thousand dollars. Um, I went to a pretty cheap school, so <laughs> I, I guess uh, if there if there's if there's it, if you're looking at education, if it's something you value, you're going to pay for it. Um, and if people in Michigan value it, then I think if they understand it, they will pay for it. So um, I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of being able to cross compare. Um, private school versus public school, who does it better? And if there's anything that we can glean from either that makes our school system more efficient. Um, obviously, Grand Valley does a really good job of, um, of, of being able to streamline costs. So, you know, we're, we're excited about that, but I think we'd still even like to see uh, less than $50,000. Okay, good, thanks. I did it in four years. <laughs> <laughs> These two gentlemen here, I think this gentleman was absolutely right when he said, do the people of Michigan value this? And the action step that should be taken is, yes, we value education and we're willing to pay for it. And at this point, when I look at what the legislators have done, um, they don't value it. And I think the action step is the people of Michigan value education and we're willing to pay for it. Okay. I say this with some trepidation in this particular group, but one of the things that I would like to see uh, action taken on as far as the K through 12 is concerned is I would reconsider the value of tenure 
and I would uh, allow a pay for, uh, let's say, particular talents. And by that I mean uh, we have, I think, a significant difficulty in attracting uh, top caliber people into the teaching of math and science at the K through 12 level. And uh, I would allow for some flexibility uh, in terms of paying uh, for particular specialties, if you will, or particular teaching areas uh, as a function of uh, demand and supply. Okay. I think you can do that partially by reaching them where they are. 
if the iPhone is the enemy in the classroom, we're in trouble. Video games, if they're the enemy in the classroom, these are maybe the things that will get students interested in math and science. If we use them in a, an acceptable way. Okay, other comments? We'll spend about three, four more minutes on this topic and then we'll talk about another one. One, one thing that, that comes to mind is the, looking at best practices uh, of different programs that we need to do in education. One of my collateral assignments right now, I'm, I'm, an, eight, I'm an advanced placement coordinator for high school, and seeing what has to be done um, to help kids move forward in, with rigor. And some things are changing in education, even a lot of people don't know, is year 2012, from then on, every student's going to be required to have two years of foreign language in high school, no matter what school you're in the state of Michigan. Um, I work closely with counselors and other individuals, and one of the, uh, another area that, that schools are looking into as far as quality is um, IB International Baccalaureate Program, which is growing in the state of Michigan, basically on the eastern side, but down in the Kalamazoo area, which also has an elementary uh, pre-primary, uh, middle school years, and uh, a high school year program, which is done all over the world. So schools are looking at things, and as one of the gentlemen said, you know, we've got to really find out what the priorities are, where we're going to take the kids in being competitive, because today the challenge is saying what we did in the past was great, but today is a new day, and we need to look with... Um, Paradigm shifts. All right, good. Thank you. A couple more comments. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I don't know if I'm wrong or right, but I'm no wrong or right in, in this discussion. <coughs> okay. Yeah, I know that there are uh, so many children. I've talked to so many involved immigrants who are here. They, they are not allowed to go to colleges. They go up to only high school, and I think that's creating a lot of problems for our community. So you would advocate allowing, uh, having a... Al allowing even illegal immigrants, because some of these children <coughs> were brought here by their parents when they were very young. But if they can be given a chance to go to colleges, I think that can help us out healthy communities. It sounds like you're advocating funding public uh, education through grade, <coughs> grade 16 instead of just through grade 12. It's funding plus allowing them to go to school because they they, are, they say that the ones I've talked to, they say that they can't go to college. They can go to, up to high school, but they cannot go to college because they don't have social security. Yes, they don't have the funds, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, well, perhaps we should move on to the next topic because I, I think you kind of wind it down on this one anyway. Let's go back to our list of topics and see what you select in the second. We'll do another vote. We'll take number one off the table this time so you can vote for uh, two through nine. How many votes for number two? And we had the discussion. I, I think it's important to go back to our list. Whoa, okay, now, <laughs> now I'm in the darkness of the vote. I think we need the lights, maybe. Yeah, thank you. Number three. Yes. One, two. I see eight. Number four. You see three? How about number five? Huh? How about number six? Number seven. Thank you, folks. Number six has zero. I'm going to have one. Number seven. One, two. Nine is what I see. Number eight. Ah, I think this is our choice. One, two. And number nine. All right, and that would be uh, we're taxing and spending priorities. Good. Let's 
again, the question becomes, what are the action steps that we should take to create clear taxing and spending priorities? So I'm open to your suggestions. Yes, sir, go ahead. Very briefly, I'll go back to basics. I think that uh, we need to <coughs> look at our revenues. In other words, I would continue the requirement for a balanced budget. Okay. That's a start. At the state level. Okay. Good. Sir? I think in the state of Michigan, we need to wipe the slate clean and we need an entirely new stat tax structure. Uh, the economy under which um, this current tax structure was created is so far different than it is today that we need a completely new tax structure. And I think um, we need some clear priorities in spending that have been identified. We've talked about one already, and that's education. And there are others, I think, that we can find agreement on within the state of Michigan. But I, I think in the state of Michigan, when we get through this recession and we're on the upswing, I think we can set some pretty high priorities, and I think the state of Michigan can, can afford to reach them. All right, good. Other comments? These two gentlemen have their hands up. Just a question, is there any state in our 50 states that is a paragon of clear taxing and spending priorities today? If there are, I'd like to know. <laughs> I don't know, but, but as an action step, that's, that sounds like something like uh, look for best practices among the other states. Yes. Done a good job of getting them out of debt. You could borrow an exchange and maybe get something done. <coughs> um, in terms of priority, I think that we need to seriously look at, um, if you look at the book on page 21, the burden of incarceration. It's a mistake. Um, we need to revisit um, who we sentence and how we sentence and how long we sentence people. We spend way too much on keeping people in jail. All right, good, thank you. Someone in one of the groups I was in said, we have to decide, we have to determine the difference between people we're afraid of and people we're just mad at. Yes. Kind of an interesting way to put it. Other comments? Yes. Anyone? I think with the clear taxing, there's the thought is that one of the previous speakers has stated that we need to really start with a clean slate because we've got to feel you know, what is a taxing structure that is fair and equitable and that we all contribute and not looking at, again, it's, uh, I think, handling the thing of special interests that, that tend to want to say, um, no, don't tax me, or, uh, you know, I'm too high, instead of saying, okay, what is, what is a reasonable rate for what we're doing to meet the spending priorities which, we have, which we've established? Okay. And uh, that's evident with local government right now with uh, tax abatements, which, Local governments do not get, which business is given for I think seven years, and that's a, that's a real challenge when you think of the millions of dollars that today local governments have not gotten, including school systems that would have they would have received under the, without tax abatements. Okay. Or some would argue that they, they wouldn't have received them because the tax abatements were necessary to lure the uh, development in, but. <laughs> There are, there are always two sides to these questions. Yes, sir, I, but I take your point, thank you. Sir? Just another question, to what extent is Michigan's current state tax code a reflection of the narrow 100% reliance upon the automotive industry? Oh, um, I, I, I can't answer that question. I'm not an economist. 
<laughs> Maybe we have some on staff. Yeah, I'll get back to you. Back in the back. Yes, ma'am. I'd be interested in taking a look at the line items on our expenditures for the state. When we talk about um, our incarceration, there, there's actually a business in this in our locality that's been trying to work for a number of years to provide the um, food and so forth for the prisoners. Uh -huh. And if they end up privatizing it um, or opening it up, they said that they could save um, up to $4 billion per year as far as, as the savings for feeding them. And the other thing is, too, for the um, legislators, after they've been involved in, in office for six years, um, we then assume the responsibility of their health insurance and so forth until they reach 55. I think it's time to really take a, a close, hard look at our line item expenditures and how we might be able to make some dramatic changes with just a few alterations that's along that line. Okay. Second, what that young lady had to say because the president of that company is my tech group. And I know the barriers that he has run into down in Lansing. There's a second business in Grand Rapids that could do the same thing by taking people who uh, are in our prisons but in a, such a state that they are not a threat to anyone anymore and removing those people from the prisons, still being in a guarded facility but under care. Uh, professional care, but it's substantially less money mm -hmm. to the state than what's currently being spent. And then both of those organizations run into the same uh, problem, and it goes back to special interest. Okay. Comment in the center. I voted for term limits. I made a mistake. We made them too brief. But part of the reason we have other problems connected with either me, the art, the leadership uh, graduates too quickly. They, it, there's a learning curve. And they just there's not enough continuity. So we should. I'm not going to say exactly double the term limits, but they should they should be extended. Oh, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You know that subject comes up in every group. Just just about every group I've done, and I've done close to 30 here over the last six months or so. Uh, the, the interesting thing about that is that when we sit down with folks like you who are uh, typically very um, involved in the community and involved in public affairs, uh, most folks in that group have come to that conclusion that term limits are a mistake for lots of reasons. However, something like two-thirds of the public at large still supports term limits, so there is this disconnect between uh, what folks in uh, leadership positions now understand about term limits and what folks out there in the general public understand about term limits and it's, a, it's difficult to persuade them that term limits are a bad idea. Well, we need a more public debate. We need some education. Okay, yeah. Pros and cons. I didn't hear those gentlemen say that we should get rid of term limits. No, I heard them say they're too abbreviated. Yes, extend them, exactly.
what those taxes are, making it clear that's the heart of the issue. And I think we can all agree that taxing should be clear. Uh, maybe it should be flat. I don't know. Um, but at least you should be able to understand where your tax, where your tax burden is going to be, and understand where those tax, where that tax money is going, and hopefully the priorities that the state um, encourages. So a citizen could also predict what their tax burden is. It's it's not a business. <laughs> it doesn't mean that, that that tax burden is nothing, though. Yep. Yep. <coughs> A concrete suggestion along those lines? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I have, uh, in a couple or three fora recently, suggested that we think about what particular taxes we personally, if we came to it, would be willing to accept in addition. It's awfully easy to say, don't tax me don't tax you, tax the guy behind the tree. But in terms of, there are a few taxes. Now, I hate paying taxes, but there are a few taxes and a few principles of taxation, particularly taxing discretionary services, just as an example, but things that are discretionary that I would be willing to pay more for myself when I can choose what particular items I'm going to uh, purchase, items or services. Okay. I haven't heard anything about roads. I think we need to invest in our road systems. Bringing tourists in and them seeing apples one after another is not the way to attract new people. So that needs to be a higher priority, is your point. Is that right, Mandy? Fix our roads, that needs to be a priority, a spending priority? Okay. I'm sorry, Mandy, I'm gonna have to disagree with you on the roads. Um, only because, uh, if, you're, if, you, if you study urbanism at all, if you study the way that our living environment is built, and the public administration folks will, will feel me on this, um, roads are kind of a losing bet, and you're never gonna make a whole lot of money on a road. Um, you're always going to be spending money on that road. Um, I, would, I would venture to guess that we, we should really be focusing our attention, and this is a, this is really a national question, on, on condensing our roads and, and condensing the way that we travel. Um, and I, I mean, that, that's public transportation. That might be a dirty word to some people. But um, I, I think it's, it's, it's long overdue when you have countries like Argentina, who are ahead of the curve in high-speed rail, and, who are, and China, <laughs> who are ahead of the curve in these areas. Um, I, I think that that's an abysmal failure on our part. Um, so it, and I, that's, that's really reshaping the way that we live. And I don't know if we're willing to do that yet, but um, long-term picture, I think that we all understand that how we live currently is, is a bit unsustainable. All right, interesting, yes, another comment. Uh, Part of uh, taxing and spending. First of all, as a businessman, you, you should know in advance what to anticipate as taxes. That's one of the big faults we have right now. But we also have an obligation to live up to our promises. I would gladly have an extra tax, whether it be on my home or on my income, so that we can fulfill the promises we made to these thousands of college students who thought they were going to get this promise to assist them to go to college. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's just a bad image for our state and for our, for our society. Let's, let's, get a, let's, let's fulfill the promise. All right, good, thank you. Quite a bit of support, obviously, for that idea. How many of you would support that, just so I can record that? Oh, well, I'm looking at maybe 20. Just as a point of interest. All right, good, thank you. Other comments? There's sort of a connection between eight and three. The more better job we do in three, the easier eight becomes, I think. We've got to really develop our economy and diversify our economy in the state of Michigan to the point where we've got a vibrant economy that can provide the revenue for things that need to be done. Then those decisions about 
how money gets separated, the priorities becomes a little bit different, a little bit easier to believe. Yeah. What is, yes. Good. Thanks. I I would echo that exactly. Uh -huh. I think that that we spend all our time talking about the priorities, how we're going to spend the money, and how we're going to divvy it up. But the focus ought to be the old business saw that business people know: worry about income, income. Don't worry about expense. Figure out how to generate the revenue. Then spending it will come. All right, good. Good points. Comment back here? I completely agree with um, the economic development factor. I think that's essential to creating the quality communities that are going to attract and retain. Um, companies and residents who are going to want to live and enjoy these places. But I shoot it for once. I think that we really need to narrow down and figure out these the, at the state level, figure out what's important, what their role is, and then get back to I revenue sharing continues to be cut and that makes it very difficult for the job of these localities to create these places for residents and businesses to live and survive and flourish. So I think that we need to figure out that revolution. I would just second Allie's point. I was at a conversation last week about the possibility of putting together a statewide health care plan for state employees rather than having all these separate silos. And so people were debating whether or not, or whether we could save 300 million, 500 million, 900 million, how much we could save as a state. And someone finally stopped us and said, well, if we can save 900 million dollars, um, what are the chances that that money will be spent on a priority that's important to you? Even if we have all that money, how do we know that it's gonna be spent? And, and things, issues that are priorities for us. So I think both are important. We definitely need to get the economy going, and then we need to know what we're gonna do with that funding once we get it. Obviously, they're linked. Yes, good points. Sir? I think, I like to separate the word spending priorities and just look at priorities. I think we're, for me, I, I, I like to put together a list, whether it's in schools or government or whatever, in, in business. What are the priorities? What is the mission that we're trying to accomplish? And lay that out first. I'm not worry about taxing, not worry about spending. What are the things that we want to do? And first of all is what is need to be done and what we want. And go through it and, and look at priorities. Uh, and then, then start looking at the next step of tech, spending and that. But I think we, we tend to forget that if we don't list out what the priorities are, whether it's helping people start new businesses or whatever, we don't have a list of focused mission. We tend to kind of go like a pendulum on a clock, go back and forth. But I think the state has, for a long time, has not looked at what are the priorities that we feel we need to be a, a vibrant state. All right. Good point. Uh, how about taking all those nine strategies you want to take the time. They all they're all coupled with each other. Yeah, we understand that. So I'm confused about the word principles. The three principles up above. All nine of those things could be uh, formed in a matrix against what are called the three principles for Michigan's funeral uh, future. Those are those are three. <laughs> Those are three operating states that we want Michigan to be comfortably operating in. Vibrant, globally competitive workforce, a vibrant economy, and effect, efficient, effective accounting. All of these nine things got to help those three things grow. Exactly, yes. They're strategies that we hope, or folks have told us they hope would accomplish those nine things. With regards to clear taxing, I think 
the discussion started out with one gentleman saying it was a third slate, which I support. And I would add to that, in building on, to look at use of technology and how to better have a taxing system. So I'm sure all of us realize that recently, 50 years ago, I didn't have much use of cell phones or the internet. So I'm suggesting a national step at least incorporate technology in terms of how the, the, the taxing methodology is done. There's probably some smart IT folks who would look at that and come up with some, some ideas on how to incorporate te technology into that process of taxing. to look at the list again and talk about something a little bit different. I think maybe so. Let's go back to the list one more time and we'll talk about one more vote. Because this time I'm going to shift the focus a little bit. We've been talking about problems. We've been talking about issues that need to be addressed and straightened out. Now I would like you to tell me about something that works, particularly in this community. So scan the list again in terms of thinking in terms of which one of these strategies actually seems to be working rather well in this community. Which one would you point to as a success? In this community. In this community, however you define the community, right. The, the Grand Rapids area, West Michigan, something like that, whatever you think of when you think of your community. But yes, not the state. We're thinking more locally than the state. All right. So think about that for just a moment, and then I'll ask you to identify which of those you think is the one that is most successful, whichever one gathers the most votes. We'll discuss that for about 10 or 15 minutes. Question? I was going to answer your question. Ah, well, we're going to vote. <laughs> but you have the answer, do you? <laughs>
but we're losing thirty thousand or so a year. How is that helping the state of Michigan? So that's uh, our problem. To me, I think is, is developing this state and diversifying the state. We've got a window of opportunity sure. in the state of Michigan sure. to diversify our industry and our economy. Let's take advantage of that. I, I don't think anyone would disagree, but this is the point of the conversation when we try to shift the focus from the problems that we have to the solutions that seem to be working. And as I say, practically every community says, well, when we look around our community, we see a lot to like. We can deal with all these problems that you have up there, or whoever wants to come up with a problem, but the thing is, where do we start? And right now, I think starting is in, in the development and diversification in the state. Your point is well taken. This is also, uh, uh, this young lady brought out the fact she'd like to see better roads. This other gentleman said, no, I didn't think that was important. If you got better roads, you're going to have more business and better business. And better business and more business means more jobs. And more people can get taxed. And we can afford the education that we all would like to have our kids have. Okay, your points are well taken, sir. Thank you. But let's talk about what's great about Grand Rapids. What's, what's working about Grand Rapids, this community? You're up. Go ahead, Selma. I'll, I'll tell you about a person who, who didn't leave Michigan after he graduated, um, who, who stayed in, in this community for a reason, uh, who stayed in Michigan for a reason, and who wants to live and work in Michigan for a reason. I think that there are a lot of people that, that believe that, which is why you have so many folks who pick quality of place. Now, I, I got lucky, I found a job. Um, you know, it, it's not perfect, but you know, it pays the bills. Um, I, I, I don't think that my state, our state, is you know, is, is a total hole in the ground. I don't think you should sell us to Canada. Um, I do think it's a, it's a really, really nice place to live, and there's a reason I'm staying. And and I think that more people. If, if that optimistic attitude were understood, if more people understood that we're going to invest in ourselves, then that quality of place is, is well, we can say that about Detroit, believe it or not, if one day we start to do those things. We could say that about Saginaw, we could say that about other parts, we could say that about Marquette. Um, and our issue is we don't, we shouldn't think in vacuums, we shouldn't think in silos, because we are one ship, we either go up together or we go down together. So. That, it, it, it doesn't behoove us to think that way. Um, I'll stop. I just wanted to comment um, in regards to the gentleman's comments up front. I too have stayed in Michigan. I'm here for at least another year. My parents are very well aware of the fact that I would love to stay here and that there is a large chance that I might have to leave the state, like many of well, young people of, and anyone of every age, everyone's leaving. But the fact of the matter is, is you also see a lot of people wanting to return and a lot of people who are scrambling to return. I have numerous friends that in the past four years have all graduated and come home every summer scrounging for jobs, teachers, um, every field. They're all trying to come back here. We just need, and I think that says something about our quality of place and how well we have done to create that. The problem is, you know, getting the economic development and getting all the jobs back here. But the advantage is the positive quality of place and home that Michigan has created and has instilled in our communities. Okay, good. Thank you for that comment. We do hear that quite frequently, too, from folks who come back and said they're glad they did. Yeah, I think this is a nice place to come back to retire when you want to retire. But when people come here, from foreign countries and they are educated, they get nothing. I know so many people who are, who are highly educated. I have my husband who has PhD, mechanical engineer. He works in a factory because everywhere he tries to get a job, nobody is hiring him. And he has a lot of friends who are working in factories. They have masters, but you see that so many children, they go to school. And we have so many people who are here and they don't have a lot of skills, but they're doing very well, but the newcomers are not, it's, there's no open hand for newcomers here. Okay. You should be aware of that. Thank you. Does anyone have any success stories they would point to? Yes. I wasn't going to point out a success story, but uh, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, or, you know, half the audience saying quality of place, I like it here. I don't really know if you're asking it to the right group of people. 
because you know I'm looking around and I'm guessing that most of us are over the age of 18 or 19 years old. So by this point, if we really didn't like it here, we, would, we wouldn't be here. I'm guessing most people have been here for years, and there's a reason people have been here for years. And you know, even the you know, even the people who are in their early to mid twenties are still here because they particularly like it. Yes, we do know that you know there is a chance that you know we might have to leave eventually, but we chose to stick around for a while. So I I I, I wonder you know even if you ask somebody you know in a, in another state you know I, the nine things what they like most about it, I'm willing to bet you that they all say quality of place. You know, especially once you get over the age of 18, 19, 20 years old. Could be. In the back, yes. Please. I'm not from Grand Rapids. I've been here for six years. The thing that works about Grand Rapids, about West Michigan, is an incredible spirit of philanthropy. This place is one of the most exceptional communities in the United States. It always ranks very highly. And the key to it, there are a couple of things. It, it is a culture here that values an entrepreneurial spirit and hard work, but it is there is a real ethos of commitment to this community. You didn't have a bunch of World War II veterans make their money and then just all go to Florida and forget about Michigan. They stay here, they reinvest here, they want to raise their children here, it has been a remarkable thing to see, and it's almost a tale of two Michigans. I read the Detroit News, the Detroit Free Press, and I read then the Grand Rapids Press. It is a tale of two Michigans. What works here could be replicated in other communities, but I think by identifying what we do have here with this spirit, this entrepreneurial spirit that has been very successful, the commitment to the community, and then a real active philanthropic uh, population that is just eager to help. Those are the kinds of things that make this an incredible place. It's where I want my children to be. All right, good. Thank you for that comment. Grand Rapids ranks second only to Salt Lake City, I believe, in terms of philanthropic giving. So it's a, it's a very pertinent point. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Gentleman over here, and then you your comment, sir? Yeah, just as a follow on to what that gentleman said, a concrete example to me. In that. A concrete example of exactly what the last gentleman said, I think, is the Van Andel Institute. That was an institute that was basically financed philanthropically. It didn't take, in its initial stages, as I understand it, a dime from any governmental or any uh, loaning authorities. It has developed itself or been developed into one of the world's best basic and medical research centers of which I'm aware. That's an example of the kind of thing that works, has worked in Michigan, West Michigan. Good, thank you for that concrete example. Down here, Mr. Stout. I, I think that to both those comments are <clears throat> extremely well taken and, and I think that, that I don't want to put a different twist on it they said it well but the, the, the thing that works in this community and sets it apart is that this community with its philanthropy or whatever assumes responsibility for its own problems and it and, and there's a long history of that I once read a monologue on how the Chamber of Commerce got organized in the late 1800s and it was to solve problems in this community and that ethic that ethic has been here from the beginning and it breaks down occasionally but by and large the community assumes responsibility for its own problems and I think that's what's successful instead of the attitude of entitlement the attitude is solve the problem. That's what I think works. And that's whoever mentioned the two Michigans. I think that's the difference between the two Michigans.
Ah, I'm losing track. Where are we? Sir? I think another thing that's really interesting about the community in which we live is <clears throat> as generous as it is, as philanthropic it is, it is wonderful if you're the beneficiary of that philanthropy. Mm -hmm. It is an arduous task if you are the beneficiary of that philanthropy because along with the, the philanthropy become, comes accountability. I think that really goes to the heart of what we've talked about here. It's not just throwing money at something, it's expecting to see results from the money that's contributed. This university is a perfect example of it, as is the Van Andel Institute and many other things. So it's just not just th throwing money at something. There's a plan, and there's a purpose, and there's anticipated results. I think one of the things that makes our community so vibrant is that there is something to do on any given night, regardless of what your interests are. And most of them are reasonably close or free. I think one of the things that makes our community great is the, the caring that is exemplified here by the many heart sides, the, the various charitable organizations that care for the homeless and the abuse. And I think that top contributes to making this a great community. Okay, good. Thanks for that comment. We hear that frequently in this area too. Other comments? Other things you'd call attention to? Success stories, perhaps? Yes. One, one thing about the quality of life, that, or the quality of the place that I find having worked in the field of education after the armed forces, uh, is that almost like the, you could say for an easier statement, the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And whether it's, it doesn't matter what age, doesn't matter what gender or that, but are you treating people the way you want to be treated? And it's amazing the results that I've seen with uh, different individuals I work with in different organizations, how things get accomplished because it's how you look at them in relation to how you look at yourself. Okay, good, thank you. Are there any other comments? solid regional model that people are speaking to here that perhaps there may be an opportunity in 2010 to expand the West Michigan model to a larger part of the state's problems. Okay, I'm not quite sure what you mean. <laughs> Take over Central Michigan? Plan, plan benefactors, the plan, accountability. Ah, I see. To perform. If, if only they will follow. Yes. There have been comments about the number of people that leave Michigan on an annual basis. Yes. Uh, is that uh, throughout the entire state, or are we an isolated area? We don't have nearly as many leaving that they're coming to us? Uh, I, I'm not up on the details of the demographic shifts that are going on within the state, but I suspect that yeah, it affects other regions more than it does West Michigan. I think this is one of the healthier areas of the state economically. And we were one of the last, I mean, I'm not exact on the facts by any means, but I know that Grand Rapids and my hometown of Midland, we were far better off than other areas in the state of Michigan when um, the economy tanked. Yeah. So I think that our diversity and the, the partnership between all three sectors and just the opportunities available have been far better over here than other areas. One more footnote, MSU, um, Chicago has the largest population of MSU students uh, outside of Michigan. Other comments? Well, I sense that we're 
winding down this evening. Why don't we wrap up our discussion? There's a couple of things we need to talk about just before we end the discussion entirely. And let's move on to those. Let me tell you about a few ways that you can continue to be involved in this campaign. This is the point at which we ask you to get out that uh, sign-in sheet and fill out the bottom portion of it if you haven't uh, had a look at that already. And if you haven't filled out the top portion, we would certainly ask you to do that also. And we'll collect those then uh, as you leave. There are several ways you can continue to be involved. One is to do what the folks here at the Homestack Center have done, with uh, organize a community conversation. If you're part of a group that you think uh, would be interested in, in having a conversation like this, maybe a church group, maybe a youth group that you work with, maybe a, a service organization or something of that kind, and you would be willing to do a little of the legwork to help get that set up, by all means let us know. We'll be happy to work with you to get that set up. We'll provide a moderator uh, and we'll hold a discussion. Now we are coming down towards the end of the process here. We're getting close to, obviously we're getting close to the year 2010. Campaigns are going to be starting before very many weeks or months go by. So uh, as I understand it, the whole process is due to be wrapped up uh, by the end of January, the whole process of holding these community conversations. So I don't know how many more they're looking to hold is what I'm trying to say here. But nevertheless, if you're interested, please let us know and, and we'll be in touch with you. That's one thing you can do. A very simple thing you can do if you'd like to keep in touch with the development of this campaign is to give us your email address and indicate that you'd like to sign up for our free e-newsletter. It comes out weekly. It'll keep you abreast of uh, everything that's going on in this campaign, and uh, you'll get a chance to see how that plays out as the election year comes around. And finally, or, well, not finally, but uh, you can also use this, the MDM Citizens Toolkit that's referred to there. That you can find online. We used to give out uh, hard copies of that, but we found that it's probably more efficient to direct you to the center's website, which is just www.thecenterformichigan.org, I believe it is. Dot net. Dot net. Correct. Thank you. It's on the on the cover of the uh, blue book there somewhere. Now, finally, one last thing I did want to mention is that uh, we are again. The slide has some old news on it. Uh, it talks about early spring 2009. Obviously, that's not. But well, we are still organizing a few of these so, of what we call action groups. These are centered around the three big themes that we've discussed this evening, the, the education and workforce theme, the economy and quality of life theme, and the accountable government theme. They're held in Lansing. They're, they're half-day sessions. Experts are brought in to talk to you about how policy gets made around these issues. So these are for people who have an interest in how policy gets made around these issues. And, are interested in participating in the discussion at that level and are willing to commit that kind of time. So if you're interested, please indicate and we'll keep you abreast of these as they are scheduled. Yes, sir. What is the, what are you going to do with the product, the report that you've developed? What's the mechanism for turning this into something more than just another stack a paper show. <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, and I'm not sure what the answer is, and I'm not sure that Mr. Power at the Center for Michigan is, has the answer for that just yet, either, to tell you the truth. Well, then how do you know why you're doing this, besides the fact that uh, somebody's getting paid to do it? Mr. Well, Mr. Power has the conviction that this is a good thing to do in the first place because it stimulates an awful lot of thinking by an awful lot of people, 10,000 people thinking about these issues and talking to their neighbors across the back fence about these issues. It can play no small part in directing Michigan's future. That's part of it. But also, obviously, I mean, to take, your point is well taken. There needs to be some mechanism for getting these ideas in front of the people who are going to be running for office. I've been talking about this several times as the evening has gone along. I don't know what that is. I'm not sure that that has been specifically developed yet, to tell you the truth. I think they're kind of waiting to see what they've got, and then there'll be some thinking around that early next year, in the winter, late winter, early spring, and the rollout will happen sometime after that, designed to coincide with the campaign as it gets really rolling in the summer. That's, I'm, that's, the, <laughs> that's the best information I have at this point. It's a good question. All right. Well, if you've had a chance to look through that sheet and fill out the uh, sign-in sheet, I would appreciate that. If you would leave that on your way out. That's really everything we came here to discuss and do this evening. 
I'll leave you with this final thought from the great anthropologist Margaret Mead. You probably encountered this idea before, but I just wanted to thank you personally for being what she's referring to here, a small group of concerned, committed citizens trying to affect change and taking uh, your role in doing the only thing that ever really has uh, created change in this world. Small groups of concerned citizens just like you. So we deeply appreciate your willing to, willingness to come out this evening, to share your thoughts. We'll take those back. We'll, we'll add them to voices and thoughts of almost 10,000 people, and we'll hope for the best in the election of 2010. Thank you very much. Yes, I do need to pick up my little clicker devices. <laughs> they won't open your garage or run your TV, so they're of no use to you, <laughs> but much use to our next conversation. Thank you all very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Grand Valley State University. Visit us at gbsu.edu.